call the meeting order at 6.02 on February 14, 2023. It's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. So men and women out there today. Uh, first thing is a review the minutes from January 2nd, uh, January 10th. Do you have a motion? Motion approved. I'll second that. All in favor? <coughs> You're next. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Are you ready? Of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I emailed you out the expense reports through January 31st. There's not a formal update because there's nothing new compared to last month. Um, the one comment I will make is if you look on the school choice report, you will notice that the transportation line shows a budget balance of negative 62,000. Um, that's a change from last month, although it's not going to have a negative impact on school choice we have a student who we had a change in their transportation needs that is special education related where we are required to transport him from um, where he resides to here as a school choice student so while i'm saying that that's not a um, financial impact to school choice that means we'll see those funds back dollar for dollar through school choice increment claim which is why we put it on here it's an unforeseen expenditure and that'll end up being a net. So we'll get revenue in that should match the expenditure. Um, otherwise, there's no other changes. And uh, Mr. Halla reviewed and signed 19 warrants totaling $1,587,671.54 since the last meeting. You got that? No, can you get my uh, almost all of the digits? One? Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yep. <coughs> Sorry, no, no, you're okay. That's it. Anybody have questions for Shelly? Okay. Uh, public comment? No public comment. Uh, reports? Uh, we have our student council person up there, right? Yes. Oh, uh, yes, sir. All right. So I have a list of stuff the student council has been working on. So the student council held a winter semi-formal dance called the Snowball in late December, and it had over 100 students attend for a net profit of $130. So that went well. Uh, Mr. Leninus will be expanding access to gender-neutral bathrooms on the third floor. Seven eighth grade students will be going on the 30th annual Philly and Washington, D.C. trip. The last week of February, due to the fundraising efforts of Mr. Hosley, Mr. Smith, and the 8th grade team. This month, the school is celebrating Black History Month, which compels us all to reflect on how we are learning about Black history in our classes and community. Also, Student Council did an event called Send a Care Nation for Valentine's Day, which sold 200 carnations. So, that was a success, and thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. Okay, George. So uh, to echo uh, one of the things that Amory said, once again, we're returning to DC and to Philly uh, the week of the 20th. And just once again, just to reiterate the folks, the students that are staying back, um, they're gonna be going to Morris Hill Needish Book Center as well. Um, and that's all being taken care of uh, in part due to the fundraising, just like I mentioned, Colin Mosley did a really wonderful job uh, the fundraising uh, is about ten thousand um, dollars, which is fantastic. Uh, so we're really thrilled about that. Um, we're gearing up for the musical this year, which is the teen edition of Chicago. Uh, it's going to be performed during the week of March, uh, the weekend of the seventeenth of March. Uh, thank you to Olivia Leone. Thank you to Tom uh, Thomas Klancik, and thank you to Janet Ryan uh, and other members of the production team. It's it's really exciting to be a part of it. And I'll follow up on about with the camera. If there's space for cameos, let me know. There are, All right. and I would like to encourage any school committee member um, to be a part of that. No lines, just a small part. Small. Yes. Thank you. Um, one of the other things that we're in the process of planning uh, in, in, in tandem with Junior Achievement is we're planning a, a career fair and a reality fair on the 28th of March. 
So we're going to be doing a career fair where we're going to have businesses coming from Franklin County to, to talk to students, and we're going to be doing a reality fair as well, which is where uh, students are given a are given sort of like a, a budget, and they get to choose you know jobs. They have to decide whether or not they want to you know, buy a, buy like a, a car or buy a bus pass, and, and sort of sort of like a, a lesson in sort of like a financial literacy and whatnot. Um, so we're excited for that. Once again, that's happening on March twenty eighth. Um, and also, we're in the process of planning for MyCap. Uh, so MyCap is uh, it's my career and academic plan. Um, this is something that uh, Innovation Pathway students are required to have. But in the discussion of the, of the plan, in the discussion of what MyCap is, we decided to expand the e-portfolio part of it to all of our students. So we've got a committee that's meeting uh, on a. Uh, monthly basis, if not more, and we're discussing um, what types of uh, items uh, students could be could be putting in their e-portfolios. It's going to be implemented with, implemented with our ninth grade students next year. Uh, it's about career preparedness, career readiness, so we're hoping they'll be able to add writing samples, resumes, cover letters, and things like that, and that they'll be able, able to have it with them electronically when they leave. Um, so we're in the process of doing that also, so things are going well. Anybody have any questions for George? Okay. Uh, we got a couple couple things on new business, and we're going to jump up and we'll put the budget on hold for a second. Uh, we have people from the Deerfield Energy Committee with us tonight, and just state your name, and the floor is yours. David Gilbert Keith, uh, chair of the Energy Committee. M.A. Sweetland, uh, a member of the Energy Committee. And um, I'm asked to be here because I blew it. Um, the Energy Committees generally get access to Green Communities Grants. And Green Communities Grants, uh, we've gotten $360,000 grants for in that ballpark for Deerfield. And when I say I blew it, uh, <laughs> I <coughs> had postponed trying to bring energy money to Frontier because I frankly didn't know that it's possible for a town to just do its portion. It's proportional to your membership in the regional committee or community. Um, however, uh, I had been talking with the building manager over the summer about um, trying to get away from fossil fuels in, the, in this building. And I didn't quite understand the pressure of the failing boilers. Um, Getting away from fossil fuels doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of the boilers. It's it's a matter of using them less. <coughs> and it, I now know, thanks to the UMass Extension Service, they have an energy extension service. Uh, ben Wheel came and looked at the school, and he had a lot of really good ideas about how it can be done here without really that much pain to, the, to change over to a, basically using electric energy for heat and even you would gain cooling. One way would be, as you probably have seen the letter I wrote, I, wrote, um, I won't go into it all over again, but the main alternatives were to do mini splits in each classroom and coordinate the air handling, which has to happen to keep the air purified and CO2 balanced. Um, the air handling would go through the central system, but the classrooms would primarily be heated by the mini splits. The few cold days of the year when the gas boilers were more efficient than the mini splits in cold weather, um, having sensors on the ventilation system and help make it work that on those days the boilers would take over for heating. 
So anyway, it can happen. There's even more money headed this way in the um, Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot of money toward municipal building improvements for energy. And what I now know is it pays to be on top of it. So I was a year behind. And if if we had another year, I think we could have paid for your new boilers, but like we did. Um, Still get it, buddy. <laughs> We're very good. Like Couldn't get the money for it. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the, the main reason we're here tonight is to hope to, that we can figure out some kind of way to coordinate with you toward the energy transition that needs to happen. And Massachusetts is really leading the way on the energy transition. And there is support. It won't cost a lot of money. It just needs preparation and applications to grants that are, will be available to make this work. So I'm hoping that we could coordinate with perhaps a capital improvements committee or somebody in the school committee toward in the next 10 years cutting back the fossil fuel use to a bare minimum here at Frontier. As I don't actually have the numbers, but I'm pretty sure this is probably the biggest energy user in the town of Deerfield. Not, not private energy use, but municipal sense. The biggest building it should be. It's yeah. the biggest building it should be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and um, so that's my pitch. It's just, I hope that we can find a way to um, work together toward getting off fossils and getting toward energy grants. Does that mean that, you know, if we want to put mini splits of every single room, is this something that you could help us with? The mini splits that we already get a discount through math, is it math safe? Correct me if I'm wrong. But really similar, similar to that. Yes. And probably as much of the contribution would be uh, getting the uh, sensors in the ventilation system that would coordinate with the central peak. Um, the alternative to mini splits would be uh, like a central big mix, you know, air pump, uh, or even a geothermal pump. Um, that might be the best energy way to go, but by going with mini splits, people are throwing money at them right now. Uh, we can supplement the benefits you already get from the, uh, the uh, mass safe program. Uh, we can add to that for actual cost, but having them work with the air handling is also an expense that has to be factored in. Do you know if our air, air handling has those sensors already? If you yeah. talk to Bill about it, or I have, and they recently <laughs> converted, to, and I forget whether it is. The old or the new is the pneumatic to the electronic or something. Um, they were recently converted to a, a way that it's easier to do the conversion, to, to add the sensors. So they aren't there yet, but they could be added. The ideal time to do it would be when we're putting in the coils. Is it a big expense? Yeah, it would be. It would probably be you know, in the realm of 150000 and how much would the energy put forth on something like that? Or? Can, can I slow this down a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> um, it seems to me that uh, really our first step should be to, to figure out a plan, how to plan, how to create a plan. So plan, 
create a plan for planning. And and the and the main steps in that are what is our goal? Um, who should be involved in that? And I think it ought to be not just the Deerfield Energy Committee. I think it ought to be all of the energy committees. Um, we are we're we're moving forward with with bringing frontier into our baseline for green communities. Other other towns can do that also. I I know they've sort of been exploring it. Um, and and so that would and if you if you do that, then green community then each town would be able to contribute their portion of the cost. Otherwise, it, I mean, either way, the cost is the cost, and and the towns pay their share. If you get green communities grants, you don't have to pay as much. So that's an advantage. Um, and the um, and so really coming up with with a group that's going to put this put a plan together so that Frontier can move forward towards getting off fossil fuels. Now we've talked to the folks at UMass. It would be great if, if you all wanted them to come in and talk here to explain sort of where they are. But more, I, I think first we have to bring create a group that's going to work on this. Does that make sense? Just started. <laughs> <laughs> Has the Deerfield uh, Energy Committee had in contact and communication with the community committees from the other towns already? Not yet. We decided because we talked to Bill Hildreth and Darius, um, we thought best to come talk to you all first and and just put in a proposal. If you're interested in it, then obviously bringing the other energy committees in seems to me to be the next step. But we didn't do that. Anybody else have any questions? Like, I guess just kind of logistically, where does that put us with making decisions about moving forward with this? As far as the boiler is yeah. concerned? I mean, I, mean I, I think we have to move forward. That it doesn't change anything about that's kind of what I'm. Yeah. But it seems to me that we, we put them in, but the possibility is that there's coordination between all of them. Or and towns to get a grant that we can reduce yeah. the usage later on if we can follow our I think the, what would end up happening is you would use less fossil fuels theoretically, depending on the cost of electricity, it would reduce your cost. Um, also, I think all of the towns are part of the aggregation um, system. I know, I mean, wait, I think Waitley is right. and. There you have to get. Uh, you're not your energy supplier is not EverSource. Is that right? It's Dynegy. Uh, direct Energy. Okay, so you're not paying EverSource prices. Okay, because that's the right now. That's that's the big uh, cost for people who are, are paying EverSource. Deerfield and people who are part of the aggregation as residents um, are paying like nine cents a kilowatt hour. And I don't know what you're paying, but um, I, I think Eversource is now charging 22 or 24. It's, it's a lot. So that's a huge difference. I was just going to, so Deerfield isn't paying a lot for electricity right now. I don't know. And obviously, you're probably not either. No, we are not paying Eversource rates. We're up for contract renewal as well. So we're currently putting out to bid. Yeah, we're going out to bid next year. I mean, next, soon for next year. Yeah. And so maybe the silver lining is you're going ahead and buy it. I think the boilers are dead. Is we'll be able to balance. You can, you know, if, if electric rates are prohibitive, you'll be more resilient. Of course, imagine new boilers will seem a lot more efficient than the they are, older yeah. ones that we will, have downstairs. We will save energy already because you can step them better right. and so on. But, um, we think you could have gotten away with fewer of them, but it, that would have been a year down the road. You know, and clearly, you got to have heat. Every day. Luckily, we haven't had a, a bad winter. Right. That right. required a lot of heat, or or the busted furnace that right. 
can't pump it out as it is right or broken or, or just somewhat broken yeah or just weak yeah. yeah so um you know you've got to go ahead but um i really think that in the next 10 years we need to move away from reliance primary reliance on fossil fuels <clears throat> And the state has rules, and I don't. Who knows what mandates they will start making? And I think that's another concern. Is that um, if we move forward sooner rather than later, we won't be coming in to, you know, at the last minute to try and cobble something together. We'll already have a plan, and we move towards it. And if the state says municipal buildings have to be off fossil fuels by such and such a date, then Frontier will be ahead of that game and, and won't be running into last minute costs and, and you know, trying to uh, put together a, a plan at, at the last minute, which might cost more than what we come up with if we spend time thinking about it. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Anybody else have anything? Last, last thought? Well, I'm just, um, how do we coordinate for them? <laughs> I mean, ideally, you'd go to the capital. Yeah. Okay. So, we have a capital improvement committee. Um, I don't know what the next meeting is. We kind of just set things up. For this, for this, it's not, the next meeting is not scheduled yet because it basically works to this hour of the year to get the capital plan in place for the spring meetings, um, town meetings and such. Um, but that's the committee that talks about the inner workings of what we're trying to put money towards and so on and so forth. Um, it also has select board members from each town on it. Um, if that's the appropriate one, or you create a separate subcommittee to deal with it. Something we can look at. Okay. So then we have a coordinated effort from all four towns. Yeah. The two that have yeah. a group committee would be probably the first logical step. So, so you, do you want us to reach out to the energy committees? Do you all want to do it? Well, since, since you know everybody from the other three towns, maybe, maybe that's the way to go. And then, you know, I'm not sure when our next meeting is going to be, like, like Darius said. A lot of it's already been done for for the town meetings coming up with the capital improvements and the Warren articles and stuff like that. So it's we're already we're like you said we're a year late, you're a little late to meet you know meet together for this type of meeting. So I mean. But but if you can get a hold of them, we can work together, I would say, on a plan in the future. Like I, you know, I totally agree with the mini splits, you know, as long as the weather's not too bad, they can work and, and take care of the energy, you know, the heat and the cooling. Um, I let's, see three in here. Uh, yes. <laughs> It, 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 at one time before they were put in, it was always different temperatures. It, you know, everything was fluctuating. Now you come in here, it's always about the same. Right. Well, I mean, you say that, but it's not entirely true. But the issue that we have, the issue we have is that when you talk about spending any money on energy resources, is that there's no insulation above the ceiling that's effective. Put your hand above the ceiling in the summer, it's 110 degrees. We had a ceiling tower. So there's a lot of other energy things that we could also be looking at that would reduce these running 100% all summer long during summer school. And you got this much insulation between 100 degrees for that energy. Green communities. But we try to we try to put money toward that. We, we don't have the budget even within our capital expending Green to fix the envelope above. actually requires that you look at the envelope. All right. So that might be. That's why it'd be good to go to the capital thing. So I think the capital committee right now it's on hold because select board members are in budget season. We're in budget season. We don't have the resources. It's just the two of us here. 
Um, so probably the next meeting will not be until late April, early May to um, at that point kind of figure out where all the, we probably have a follow-up meeting to the different projects that have taken off so we can start the conversation there. Um, and then that, again, that committee, again, kind of does most of its work between September and November. We have, you know, three or five meetings, three or five meetings this summer. That's this, okay. We're looking at basically a long haul. What is the timeline for grants for that? Well, it depends if we put it towards you or not. <laughs> uh, but the state timeline, I mean. State timelines are two times a year. Um, Usually we can only pull out one a year because you have to expend your funds and show all of it counted before you can apply again. Uh, you know, we did all the street lights and things like that in the last year. It took a while to even say what we've done. But um, we also did the gas boilers at the elementary school. Uh, that was three or four years, three or four years ago. But, um, you know, so potentially the next thing we could apply reasonably here would be in the next fall. Well, that's the next granting cycle, but if we're not going to start meeting until um, April, yeah. April or May, and we have to have an engineering study done usually for the grant and da 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 da, you're going to be coming up pretty tight on a November deadline. So, um, but then, but we'd be very prepared for spring and continuing to put the mini splits in gets, you know, if that's the direction that everybody decides to go in, um, then, you know, then things are, are moving ahead. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't expect that, I think, I mean, I think, I would guess that we'll probably bring in some consultants. This group will bring in some expertise. We are not experts. Um, and so, you know, our plan is is whatever, but it, it makes sense. This is a long-term plan, so it makes sense to take our time and and figure out the best plan over the next 10, you know, for the next 10 years or, or whatever, is to really put together, including, you know, the roof is going to be worked on in the next six or so years, I understand. The yes, first phase yeah. is going out. Yeah, and so well. insulation, I mean, I suppose that's the soonest you want to probably do insulation if you're going to be carrying it apart. But if, if, we, if the plan is to do it sooner and and we do it from here rather than from there, um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's the first thing that we do. So how we how we put this plan together is really up to the bigger group. Um, and and figuring out what what need what we need in order to create that plan. As far as uh, HVAC projects, we have nothing in the queue for the next two years, so we're not adding any more mini splits for the next two years because we don't have that oh. So um, the, we did the project on the third floor um, last year, right? Your peers, right? That was last year, but we don't. Yeah, you, you know, there was talk about expanding that, but right now we don't have the finances to do any expansion of that. So there's no other projects that. You need to, need to worry about time wise to sweep in in order to, to affect those. Right. This would be any new project going forward. So maybe if maybe if the other towns get signed up for green communities, it's it, it's a lot of data collecting. There's already been well, um, we worked with FERCOG to put to get all the data together for Frontier. So all of that work is done. There's been an energy audit. There's Eversource came in and did, or actually uh, one of their um, okay. contractors, thanks, uh, came in and did that. So that's been done. So the, base, the basic work for collecting for, for the towns to uh, get the get on to the green, get frontier onto their green communities has been done. And so, assuming that they want to do that, then you know we we could start applying for um, H well, you know, in, uh, energy efficiency stuff sooner rather than later. But just to put it on the radar, there's a thing in the Inflation Reduction Act about 
solar on municipal and school buildings that would allow you to get the equivalent tax credit that a third party contracting company putting solar on your roof would get from their tax credit, you can get that paid in cash back to you as an in the even first, as that would a be public in the first school. year. Uh, it's good for the next 10 years. No, but I mean if that payment comes in the first yeah, year yeah. of the investment. Pretty sure. Anyway, the, the things are changing. So, you know. <laughs> well, we appreciate you coming and, and Who giving us a little help. Who should our contact hit? person be? I'm just... <laughs> Me. Okay. Uh, Jim. Bob um, Nick. No, um, so, yeah, I'll be in contact with the spring meeting. Okay. I'll put you on the um, agenda. Do you have our contact information? Or do you want so to go? Okay. All right. So that's okay. it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next, next we have a, um, a plaque proposal. Uh, Chris Williams is the baseball coach, uh, Frontier Regional, and he's also, hope I get this right, he's also the gym teacher up at Conway. Yep. Uh, and um, we have a person that has helped um, baseball and football for years in Ridge Walt, but I'll let I'll let Chris take over and tell us what you want to do. All right, so yeah, first, um, you know, thanks for making time to, to hear me out with this. Uh, Coach Walton, uh, he was somebody who passed away this past August. Uh, he started coaching at Frontier in 2000, ended up continuing to coach through 2012. Um, two sports, volunteer coach. Um, you know, showed up every day if a varsity coach was running behind schedule coming from a job, he was right there. His Pelican got out early, so he'd, he'd take care of us. Um, you know, this guy, he had three kids go to, go to Frontier. Uh, he's a Vietnam War veteran and just somebody who, um, you know, myself, I cherished time with him when I was a kid, even as I was older, you know, Recently, he was coming to all the baseball games, giving us stuff for our raffles. Um, you know, he and I going back and forth about different players, all that different type of good stuff. Um, you know, other alumni. This is something, I mean, we were talking about trying to come up with something that we could do to honor him before we even knew he was sick. Because this is someone who, who did. They went above and beyond for, you know, 12 plus years. Uh, with two sports and you know coaching one sport is a headache within itself so um he he took it on so we were thankful for that um and then you know when he passed all of us at the weight getting together at our golf tournament stuff like that um you know everyone's everyone's on the same board and we all want to want to see if there's if there's something we can do for him uh so this is the plaque uh that I designed with uh, Bright Idea Shops, the company that we'd be going through. Uh, we have a spot in our dugout where we would want to attach this right at the spot where he's parked and give us all fist bumps when we come in for a run. Uh, so yeah, that that's that's what we're trying to do. So if, if that's something that, that people are in favor of, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, former current athletes at Frontier are, are gonna be thankful for that. Anybody have any questions for Chris? So I just making sure I understand. So we like in the dugout, this you know, have to say it's gonna go right in there and call the baseball players. Yeah, is it so, 10 by is it 10 by 12? It is 10 by 12. 10 by 12. I will say we might make it 10 by 8, depending on what will look better centered in the case that it were able to happen. I'd let the guy know to be flexible about that. But yeah, so if you're facing the dugout, um you have the big opening and then there's you know the the side of the building and on this side we have the flag of all the people who made the dugout happen back when um 
And then on the other side, we were going to put this plaque in honor of Coach Walton. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, you, he's already raised the money. You can tell us approximately how much it's going to cost, but you've already raised the money for the plaque also, correct? Yes. Uh, so, yes, we have $620 uh, for our quote. But, yes, our baseball team, um, we have a booster club. So uh, myself and the parents, we work together for all the, all the money that we're raising for this kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, we would be... We would be taking out, taking care of it on our own. Yes. So I'm just going to bring up the uncomfortable side of these <laughs> discussions that we right. don't usually bring forward. That our policy really goes forward and talks about <laughs> that a school uh, recognizing the death of student staff member, prominent committee member, is deeply felt by the school committee as a as places designed primarily to support learning. School sites should not serve as a main venue for permanent memorials. And so my in. And so that's your policy, and, and you can overturn that, I and mean, that's why Chris is here tonight. But my only sort of caution on that is anybody who dedicates their life to students in this building deserves a plaque. And I don't know, I don't even know I worked here, I, I never got to know um, this gentleman who you know helped out our teams and such, but you know, we have people who, it's just something you have to consider that when do you say yes and when do you say no, um, and you know, basically, you start setting precedent on those kind of things. And so, because um, this is a memorial pack, it's not there's not a donation connected to it. It's not you know you know funding certain things, which is you know what we did when we do um, you know athletic field dedications and that kind of thing. Um, you know that. So I don't. I just I want to put that out there, and that's why it's here, not just being done in house, because there has to be a checks and balances of you know there are other members of our community that we lost this year that we all can think of very quickly. They get memorials as well within our site for their dedication. So I just wanna make sure that this committee understands that's why it's here in front of you. And you're like, thanks a lot, Darius. Um, <laughs> but, but that is why it's in front of you because it does take um, kind of you know a group of people to make that decision rather than one person who can be pulled one way or another by um, the emotions of a, of a person's dedication to a district. So. I just gotta want to say that piece because it so my thoughts. Does anybody else have any questions for Chris or about the plaque? Or I guess I would ask um, the policy saying that past has been in the form of perpetual awards or scholarships. Um, did you ever consider the possibility of going in that route? Um, I mean, I, that's, that's definitely a, a quite reasonable way to, to go forward with it. And I think that is something, you know, I can definitely talk to his wife about, um, talk to his kids about our, our booster program and, and see if that's something um, that we would move forward with. I feel like if it were to be that, that that would be something um, we'd certainly be able to help help them, but I do think that'd be something that would be separate from baseball fundraising, because um, baseball fundraising we see it as it does apply directly to our equipment, directly to our facilities, um, and that and that was why we were we were thinking we wanted to have him a, him a part of that that kind of thing, where each day he's part of that dugout, um, just some good mojo. Good. Good vibes for a guy who really did. I mean, the volunteer coaching aspect. There's there's not a lot of people who who do it for that long. Um, I want to just say I knew Rich. I I used to see him at the football games, the baseball games. Even when he was a kid, Rich was right there helping out these kids and stuff like that. Um, you would you know if you lived in Deerfield. You probably saw him walking the streets all the time with his wife, you know, he, and the dog, huh? and, and his dog. dog yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think, I think the scholarship part of this could work out good too, but I'm not sure how far fundraising goes, how big the scholarship would be. You know, if you rate, just say you raise $10,000 a year, then you could probably give a $500 scholarship in his name. Yep. I just I just drew a number on here. So. Yeah. Yeah. And 
the other thing is, I guess, like, kind of just thinking about as you said it, like, that is an annual um, thing that we would be organizing and all of that kind of thing, that that would be coming out of our budget annually. Well, it, this is something that it's a, you know, it's a one-time, one-time cost for us. Uh, do we have other memorial classes around anywhere we've done this before? Um, <laughs> the library is housing points are it's the free guard memorial library. Oh yeah, if I go down gym. If I go down gym. And we like the Valentin Field is uh, is dedicated to Tom Valentin. Um, you have Zabeck Field, um, you know, over there. I'm sure, it's going to be <laughs> shot in court at some point, Coach K style. <laughs> um, and obviously, there is a difference in their role and what Rich's role was, which is why you know we're not trying to dedicate the field or. Um, you know, we had we had talked about a foul pole because we're, we're getting the new fence this year. But you know, that was something that I spoke with Bob about, and he reminded me of the school's policy, and you know, uh, let me know that that was something that was going to be a stretch based on based on his role compared to someone who did work in the school district for twenty plus years, and you know, and that kind of thing, um, which is which is why we were trying to take it down a peg, not put something dedicated to him, but instead something that would just recognize him as, you know, as our guys are coming in and out of the dugout, um, you know, umpires will see that and they'll love that too, all that kind of good stuff. But, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll make a motion to accept the black, the dedication black. Ask a question or go ahead. have stop because you already said something. No, go ahead. So, if a scholarship or what our bylaws and our, our policy is is to have something that's more that is not about the physical facts, sort of thing, um, I, I understand that it might be something that then every year people have to get together and remember Rich. I mean, he had a huge impact on my life all growing up. He was my next door neighbor my entire life, and so. Um, so I definitely like get it. I super want to honor him, um, and I, you know, I, I know you put a lot of work into this. I'm not trying to like second guess you at all, um, but you know, as someone from the community, you know, I would be someone who could be hit up every year. You know what I mean? To come together to remember him to create some sort of scholarship for a baseball player yeah. or something like that. Um, so maybe just thinking of you know, something like that if that's what our policy has, because I, I really think he was a huge not just a member of the school and the coaching staff, but he impacted kids everywhere. I mean, our whole neighborhood, like really, he was just an amazing, amazing person. Um, and I, um, I, I think he'd be honored that you were wanting to do this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did not know Rich, and I'm operating within the, the language of the memorial, probably memorials of the school show and they perform a special scholarship to award. Is there a way that, um, an award can be made in his honor to a baseball player at the end of the season, so it's not the financial burden to have to fundraise every year. You could give out on the what he stood for for a particular player every year. Yes, that is something. Um, you know, when I was speaking with alumni boosters, um, you know, just kind of our our circle of I mean, we have a big circle now because we do a lot of fundraising. But um, when I was communicating with those people. That was that was something that we that we spoke about and something that we will definitely be um, considering exactly what we wanted to stand for um, when we <laughs> when we are giving that award. But yes, we are definitely going to be um, considering that moving forward. Be interested in that as well. I, I think that that would be the bill that I want to recommend. Yeah, I'll admit it. 
I so want to support this. I, I love sports and I love the impact that Cody has put on, on kids. But I also am a little weary of the precedent set and moving forward and where we then draw the line. You know, we've had many individuals, sports, uh, academic, teachers, staff, and I don't know then how to curtail that move forward other than just having a meeting every time someone comes in and just make a vote on it. Uh, it's, it's easy to say yes to everything. It, it's just, it's, it's an awkward, it's an awkward position. Bill, you have anything to say? You're awful quiet. Yeah, I, you knew Rich. My only concern is, is much the same as Jamie is. I, the line, there will be a line. Yeah. Anymore. There yeah. won't be a line anymore. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. It, it's how, how do you measure any one person's performance to a particular sport, group, club? You know, it, it's it's really hard to do that. We 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 have to have a wall as big as that wall to put them all on there because. And I'm not selling short anybody's anybody's achievements in any in any. But you can think of you can think of them up and down here, and so can I. I went to school here in the '70s, and I've been here ever since. You can, I can come up with ten. 10 people in a minute, you know, that you'd love to honor, but you have, you have the policy for a reason. And it's not to be cold hearted. It's not trying to ignore anybody's achievements or anybody's contributions, but it's, it's, it's a common sense thing. You look through a lot of those policies. That's, that's what they're made for. For to take the heart out of these situations to go, look, here's the policy. Unless you want to vote to change the policy, this is what it says. And the easiest way to keep yourself from getting jammed up is to stick to the Okay. Since I, since I, go ahead, Mary. No, I was, I was just gonna say I, I agree with Bill. But I have a huge appreciation for thought that you put into it and finding something in proportion to the contribution, like you, you didn't ask that appeal to me or. Very thoughtful, thoughtful way to honor. And it but, seems like a minor thing. Take the plan, tack it up on the corner of the dugout. It seems like no big deal, but you have to, you really do have to step back and look at the picture. Yeah, think of bigger So if I don't have a second for for the plaque, so I'm not sure what my next step is if there's not a second. I mean, well, second to vote doesn't move forward, so it does. You can't. <clears throat> Unless you, first you got to vote to, however you check about the policy. I don't think we can take a, a blatant vote that violates policy. That would be. The policy says you can make an exception. The policy says you can, I don't know, maybe sent it up. A permanent one. You did Unless authorized by the school committee to the contract. You can make a special authorization with the school committee. So, but talking about Robert's rules, if you don't get a second, then right. the motion doesn't carry, and therefore it sits there. And if someone wants a second, then you can, if someone seconds it, then you go to a formal vote. So, I, do I have a sec? Do I have a, a second? No second, then it's. Sorry, Chris. That's what it is. No, so, I, I, let's, I, come, let's, let's come up with plan B then. You got, you got some ideas. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, think we got some really ideas. Help, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You know me, I'll, I'll help yeah, with any fundraising type of thing. So. <laughs> you got it. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, but not that, that everyone supports recognizing and honoring yeah. them. Just... Yeah. I, hey, I understand. Absolutely. But um, yeah, thank you for making the time for our guests. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Okay, it's your turn now. Okay. All right, so I sent you out uh, the full budget summary. Um, subcommittee has, what? 
Mary Lavinia gave me a tired face and I just like, smiled at her. <laughs> <laughs> No, that doesn't feel, it doesn't feel better at all. No. Sorry, Chad. That's okay. We can take a moment. Everyone's human. All right. Okay. All right. So, Budget Subcommittee has met twice now. Uh, we met in January. Uh, Bill gave you a quick update that it was too early to discuss any numbers, and we were working on it. So, here we are in February. <coughs> presenting a second draft to you um, with the caveat that we do not have assessment data to discuss because we do not have the governor's budget yet. So we're really just talking about the increase that we're presenting. Um, and because this is the first time school committee is hearing this and for um, our limited public that's here, I'll go through the whole beginning to end of the presentation. Um, you can stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have questions as we go. And then we'll definitely come back to questions in the end. Um, so when we start building the budget, uh, we take into consideration a needs-based student-centered approach while being fiscally responsible. Um, input is taken from principal as well as other administrators, so facilities director, IT, uh, Darius, myself, <coughs> anyone who's sort of in that um, higher level administrative role to make sure that we have all of the expenses met uh, for the coming year. Uh, we start with level service, but we also look at new initiatives. So level service means that we're replicating our existing staffing and existing programs. It does not mean level funding, however, because we take into consideration COLA, um, changes for inflation, things like that. Um, but we do look at existing programs and staffing and then consider new needs and initiatives. Um, one thing that I think is important to know as we go through this process is what that percentage point is because we're always talking about, you know, can we be under 3%? Are we going to be at 5%? So what does that one percentage point mean for Frontier? 1% of last year's budget is about 122000 So <coughs> that first step for level services um, is to really look at wages. So we build in any wage increase for contractual obligations, so IAs and teachers, we start there. Then we look at school-based staff, so uh, principal's office, secretaries, custodians, cafeteria staff, and then final central, finally central office. Uh, those folks are not on contracts necessarily um, in the same way that teachers and IAs are, but we do uh, factor in a wage increase for them. So starting point, first step of this, we were looking at a $232,000 increase just for wages. So already almost at 2% going into um, the first step of this budget. That's pretty typical. You know, our budget is salary heavy. Um, if you look at some of the da data that I provided for you, it does make up the majority of our budget. So this is a normal, uh, typical <coughs> increase for salaries and wages. Um, then we look at expense accounts. So I look at prior year history, go over three years, with any directors that are responsible for various departments. Uh, we consider what we know for inflation, so items such as um, transportation costs, our out-of-district placements, uh, increase to insurances, uh, increase to our retirement assessment, and then we also look at facilities expenses. So the initial draft of the budget presented an additional $182,000 for non-salary expenditures. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, again, that is not new initiatives. That is just covering our needs for the budget. So for the out-of-district placement, we are seeing an increase due to uh, what the state passed for the inflation rate for private programs. We will see some of that funding back in Circuit Breaker in future years. So it's not a full expense to us um, in the future. The current year budget, we will see that hit. Uh, and then we have a $55,000 increase for our Franklin Regional Retirement Assessment, and then a $27,000 increase for facilities expenses. That would cover line items that are currently over in the budget. So if you look at the expense report I sent you year to date for the current year, if you look at the water and sewer line, you'll see that that account is already overexpended. That is a multiple year deficit that we've had in the water and sewer line. So I am asking school committee 
to right side these accounts in this first draft of the budget and bring the funding where it should be. Um, so that's a summary of those expenditures there for non-salary increases. Uh, then we look at other budget drivers related to special, special education. So specialized transportation, transportation um, and additional out-of-district placements that might be coming up. Uh, we, were, we will be seeing a $17,000 increase for transportation costs for special education next year. Next, we look at revolving funds and grant revenues. So we want to make sure that any grant that we fund uh, salaries or non-salary expenditures and any revolving fund that we help offset the budget with has the revenue coming in to cover the expenses from the prior year. There will be no impact due to revolving funds or grant funds um, for next school year. <coughs> uh, so we will be able to fund all of our existing expenditures for revolving in grants. And uh, the last step of the process is to look at new initiatives. So uh, this comes again from senior administrative staff who say, uh, you know, if we could have everything that we want and need next year, these would be new initiatives that we're looking for. Um, so there were the addition of two new IAs added into the first draft of the budget based on student need, as well as a school adjustment counselor. What I want to make a note of with the school adjustment counselor is you've heard about this position already. It's a position that we added for the current fiscal year. We had originally planned to cover that with a grant. We were going to use ESSER money, um, but we're now putting it on budget because of other savings from leave of absences and then some other expense lines um, that have freed up funds there. So for next year, it is a true hit to the general fund. Uh, we're not going to throw it on ESSER funding again. We're trying to avoid paying salaries and wages from that money because it's going to go away. So we need to absorb it into the budget. We're also using ESSER to help pay for uh, part of our boiler project, hopefully that gets approved by the state, and then some other programmatic needs. <coughs> um, so with that position, we are reallocating resources from another teaching position based on student enrollment and scheduling from the fall. So we were able to swap out those salaries from an existing position for this position. So the net increase um, has a zero impact to the general fund for that position next year. But we felt like it was important to talk about as part of the budget process. The two new YAs are also based on student need that would have a direct impact to general fund and that would be an increase of 48,000. You know I talked quickly, went over a lot of pieces. Um, it's all there in the report, so if I missed anything, please let me know. Taking all of that into consideration, the first presentation to the subcommittee was 3.91%, um, which is not hugely outside of the realm for an increase for Frontier. If you look at the last page of the report I sent you, last year we had a 3.64% increase. So 3.91 is not significantly higher. Um, however, the subcommittee did ask us as administrators to go back and work on that. Uh, they felt strongly that we should be closer to 3%, given what we know of the climate, inflation, our elementary schools, um, and the positions that some of our towns might be in financially. Uh, so we went back and did some work <coughs> um, and reduced the budget uh, to a number of about 1% we cut off, which was about 120000 uh, We're presenting to you today draft two at 2.92%. To get to that point, we eliminated 73,000 in non-salary expense increases. So all of those pieces I just talked about, <laughs> Darius is laughing because this sort of sometimes seems silly to go through this process where we're adding and then taking it away. Um, <coughs> sorry, I have been coughing for six weeks, so bear with me for a minute. Um, let me go back up here. So the things we just talked about, the increases for insurance, the increases for facilities, I pulled those off. And it's really easy for someone to say, well, why did you add them in the first place if you don't really need that money? We do need that money. Our budget lines are overdrawn. <coughs> we have historically been able to find funds to cover those expenses. Um, substitute teacher line is a perfect example. It's very rare to find subs coming in that are not within our own building right now. So if we're not spending all of that sub line, we can reallocate it to cover the water bill that put us over $10,000.
we've done that for several years with these expenses. It, this is not the right way to go about budgeting. We really should fund our lines properly. However, we recognize that if we want to bring the budget down, outside of cutting positions or programming, you have to crunch some of these non-salary expenditures. So we pulled those pieces back out. You'll probably hear me present again next year that we need to add them back in. Um, and if it were a perfect world, we would keep them in there. Same thing with the IAs. Uh, we do need those positions, and I certainly defer to George to, to talk about them further. But uh, we met administratively and said we cannot afford an increase of $50,000 plus benefits on this budget. Something has to go. That doesn't mean that we won't hire two IAs. It means that we may have to be creative administratively and, again, reallocate funds just like we did with the uh, school adjustment counselor position. So those things might still come into play. Um, they're all really important pieces. Uh, one final part of the 73,000 for non-salary expenses is I went through line by line and looked at every budget number in there, which we have hundreds of accounts. If an account had uh, for multiple years, $500 remaining in the balance, I pulled that off. Another line had $1,000 remaining. I pulled that off to get us a $25,000 cut from the budget. Again, not the proper way to do this. <laughs> We're cutting any cushion that we have in those lines, and they're all important lines. It's just that maybe one year we ordered less toilet paper than the prior <laughs> year, you know, and, and that's the cost of, of doing business right now. If inflation is high, we really could need that $500. There's, there's plenty of toilet paper. There's no need for anything. <laughs> The new stockpile. <laughs> no, we're not stockpiling for the paper. Um, so this is not the way that we're comfortable presenting and creating a budget. We really shouldn't be shaving off our expenditures in this way. Uh, but in order to cut 120000 the only other option is staffing. And you're talking about at 120000 you know, if average salary is 65 to 70, you're potentially looking at two teaching positions, which... I don't think anybody in this room wants to do unless we're absolutely in a budget um, crisis and we don't feel like we're there right now. So we took other avenues uh, to bring that number down. So our overall budget at 2.92% will come in uh, if, if this goes through um, public hearing and then final budget approval. Uh, $12,595,201, and then we will use revolving funds and grant money to fund another roughly million dollars, so our budget will be at about $13.5 million overall. Um, to kind of rewind a little bit, yeah. um, so the proposal we're looking at is 3.64. But the meeting, I assume, that just happened right before this meeting is what kind no, of No, you're looking at 2.92. The 3.64 is FY23, which is the current year we're in. Got it. So to go, and then the original budget you guys came up with for 24 was 3.91. And then, got it, okay. And then all of you who are on the budget committee wanted to bring it down closer to three. Correct. Is that because there is, like, I don't know the way to say it, is that because the, the towns are asking us to try to get it that low? Is that just from past practice? Is that past experience? I mean, yeah. I, I, All right, so it, 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 I, I'm let sure me do this my statement real quick. Because if we keep, like, <coughs> You don't want to make budgets like that where you're taking a thousand dollars here five hundred dollars here and that's not the way to do it i would assume at some point this is going to catch up to us and then we're going to be coming up with a budget that's five percent and then the town is going to look at it and go oh my god why did you go from three to five like like right. if the best budget to have is 3.91 why not we propose 3.91 so the best budget to have is 2.5. And the reason is that the town can only grow by two and a half percent a year. 
And so anytime the budgets come in over two and a half percent, they the town has to figure out, you know, and then when we say this, then the towns get assessed. But let's say we're just dealing with one town, because it gets more complicated with the regional setting. If the town has to figure out how to fund anybody that comes in over two and a half from their either reserve cash or whatever. So as a school, the kind of the rule of thumb is you want to be around two and a half to three. And we can't be at two and a half all the time, especially if you know we have cost of living adjustments that are higher it's the majority of our budget that are higher than two and a half and we have to move those higher from time to time as part of negotiations and also part of the economy as a whole so that's mainly what you were saying like what keeps us why did the town always say two and a half well that's why some towns lead by that and i've gotten memos from a town that says we'd like to see your budgets come in at two and a half they say that every year and that's the reason for it that's also the reason for anybody listening that's also the reason for the importance of an override every so often because you can only, after a while, you're, when you're growing your town budget, you have to have a jump year to straighten out for inflation and all those other things. But people don't look at it that way because they're not, you know, they don't truly understand. I don't want to say that they don't truly really understand. They don't want, let's pretend I don't know what they understand. Okay, so, but anyway, so, the, but that's how that kind of works. So that's why you, you'll hear us around that. So as a school, we will bounce kind of back and forth. Some years we'll take a little bit more than our share, and some years we take a little less. So this year, as Shelley also said, we also have to look at the, I have to look at, you guys don't have to, but I look at the elementary schools and what their demands are from the town. And three of the four elementary schools are gonna be up this year um, and are, are doing a lot of tweaking in order to get their budgets down, including staff reductions. Also has to do with their population coming down. Okay, and our population at Frontier, as you can see the population numbers, which we'll get to in a second, or you guys can scan ahead, um, is coming down. And it is trending to come down over the next few years. Um, we predict um, two years of kind of a little bit smaller, a big drop, then a pop back up. And then when we get to like third grade and below that's coming up, so maybe four or five years out, we're gonna drop significantly again and stay there unless we have a change in our population from our Sunday schools. Meanwhile, the schools, the elementary schools are making adjustments in the number of students they're accepting, which means our school choice enrollment is gonna come down because school choice enrollment Majority comes from our feeding schools. Okay, they don't all come in seventh grade. We only get like you know five to seven each year in that area. So this year will get smaller unless the population of Franklin County changes or our towns changes as well. So saying all that, I'm giving you more information than you ask for. That's why the percentage we want a year we asked in here around three or lower. Um, and also that we're seeing that we probably is not a year where we should be ballooning the budget when we know in the next few years we're probably going to be probably yeah, reducing we'll probably be slowly reducing and hopefully do it not hopefully we will do it in a mindful manner so that you know um, do it through attrition do it through cutting courses or, or classes that lack enrollment and you know moving shifting things around you know but we are going to get relatively smaller I mean, unless something happens and the rest of the freaking county is getting smaller too so but um the other things to are you pointing us in? No. Um, the other thing also that will come up is what about other financial um, things coming from the state? So what about um, uh, rural aid? Well, we you know right now, um, more at least I got a memo today from our advocates of the state, um, and basically they're talking about increasing rural aid. Well, how much? They increased by hundred thousand dollars. That could help us offset some of these things, and it'll go straight into where we can pay for some of these maintenance things this year the problem with rural aid is until they guarantee it we're going to be bouncing back and forth what's on the general budget and what is not i mean unless they can say we will guarantee hundred thousand dollars a year for the next 10 years we can't run our general budget off of it we have to continue to kind of build funds um they also talk about um, transportation about funding that at 100 percent. we can see what that looks like if that comes through that'll help our transportation funds um fair share agreement that everybody we, you know we both endorse it they said, don't expect any money. It's going to take right now. They don't even how they don't even know how they're going to um, appropriate. They don't even have rules and how they're going to appropriate that money. And if you read an article today, they now cut the amount of money that they're going to get in half because of loopholes in the tax law. So if you look at that, that's kind of a mess. So I wouldn't expect money from the fair share to be hitting um, K to 12 education. <laughs> I think that higher education is going to get the money first. That's just what we're hearing amongst politically. Don't mark my word on that. Newspaper, don't quote me on that. Um, and then SOA money, we're not, we don't get any. We get cost per pupil, 
and we're in the health harmony stage, so we do actually we don't lose any money because our population is going down, but we don't gain any money. And basically, 20 districts in the state around don't vote down this paper um, <laughs> get gets the majority of that SOA money, and those are the in about 20 percent. Those 20 districts holds over 50 percent of the state population, so it, it is going to the students. But a lot of districts like ours that are as wealthier on paper um, isn't getting much money. However, more Achilles came out of the out of one of the conference committees today about maybe moving price per pupil to a hundred dollars a pupil. Again, ten thousand dollars, not a huge increase, but every ten thousand dollars helps for those areas of the budget that Shelly just trimmed back. You know, those line items that we just trimmed back, like, how are you gonna pay for it? Well, these are different ways that that money would be. So that was not only answering your question, it was my list of stuff I had jumped on. <laughs> like, I'm not answering another question again. No, it's a really good question, and I think the subcommittee had this conversation last year because 3.64 is a little bit on the higher side still for what our 23 budget was. And when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, 120,000 based on the four-way cost share percentage in the assessment is its little impact. That's why I propose it. Why not just go But the optics of it, I think, is part of what we have to be aware of as well that you know if, if our towns are saying you know the schools are 60 70 percent of our budget and you're taking away from all of these other departments while well, we have to advocate and fight for what we need and want we also have to be mindful of those other pieces while being fiscally responsible so it's striking a balance but i also throw out there i talk to the authority of table it's not my decision it's your, your, it's your budget. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, like, you don't feel comfortable, you want maintenance budget to be fully funded, and you have that discussion, and you say, Shelly, what does it cost? Put the maintenance budget back in, and it comes up, goes up a whatever, a tenth point or two, whatever it is. That could be what you guys want to do. Don't take whatever we say as, you know, we do our best to put a budget together. Um, after you do it for a few years, you understand all the moving parts. It makes it a lot easier. And that's also our budget subcommittee has been doing it for a few years, so they they're quickly, they're jumping on like, oh, they understand what the different things are, but feel free to ask questions or disagree with our priorities may not be where your priorities are. So I, just, I know you may already know that, but I'm gonna definitely wanna say that out there because I kind of think that Yeah, and that's part of why we like to give you all of the data, even though we pulled it out and are recommending this, you're seeing clearly what the increases are driven by. If you felt really strongly about something, you can certainly add it back in take it to public hearing, see what the assessment looks like, and go from there. What are the reasons that we ask them to do this exercise almost every year? Is that not so much to make the cut, but let me see what it looks like. Then I, if you came back, we sat there an hour and a half ago, and you said to me, okay, it's a science and an English teacher to give us what you asked. Nope, <laughs> save it to play, we're done. But that's why they went through the meticulous exercise of finding the bits and pieces to put this together without, I won't say there's no impact, because there's always an impact, right? But there's no programmatic impact. There's no, you know, we're losing a sport or we're losing a club or we're losing this or that. We're trying to hold, hold the ship together one way or another in deference to what's going on in the towns with the elementary budgets. Try to make it all, I'm usually the only person who uses the word optics. Thank you, somebody else worries about how it plays I, I guess i worry too much but i i do because i know what the town some of the towns are going through in terms of their elementary budgets all you have to do some of them are, are big increases so whatever we can do and we're not hitting them we've done a lot of the capital stuff in house we're not there's no big capital bite in in the on the warrants this year so it, it's a good year for us to try to try this trick and see if we can make it work I think it's great. I think we talked about the capital. It's important as you constituents <laughs> talked about the complaining about the budget, that kind of stuff is that the amount of capital projects that we did funding through school choice, smartly using ESSER, um, that kind of stuff. You know, if we can pay for that much of the boilers, it's not going to go to the town. Um, school choice on the parcel of tennis courts, you know, um, you know that those are the, and then, uh, and then the roof as well. I mean, those are three major projects that um, are the most controversial. It's on the law, but um, shifting money around, um, working with the state on that. So, well, those are smart moves with that money. 
know, all that stuff is hugely creative. Like, you know, we did the tip of the gap for pulling all this off and then being able to give us something that was under under three. There's just, I don't know, there's some people that see a two point something. I don't care if it's 2.99, it's not three. You know, as silly as that sounds, that's what finance committee and select the brings look for. They really, they really do. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Okay. So do we need to vote the tentative budget figure? What's that? Do we need to vote a tentative budget figure or wait till after the hearing? I think we normally vote a tentative budget to bring to hearing just so that just so the community the committee's communicating as is. I think that's what you guys normally do. You do a tentative budget to go to the hearing. And we're all in agreement that that's the budget going to hearing. Okay. Is that how we've done it? We also vote it's on it again. Than I have. Yeah, but don't yeah. we vote on it again? <laughs> Does that mean it's Decker's number? <laughs> this is not officially voting the budget. This, this is not is voting budget. The this budget is this. We agree that this is the hearing. budget that we want to bring to the public hearing. Um, at the public hearing, we will. That is March. Seventh. It's March seventh again. We're gonna have the hearing on the seventh. We have to come right back around the next day to have a meeting on the eighth. Um, uh, and because of deadlines the 11th i also wrote in that memo i sent you guys i've also placed hold friday the 10th if everything goes upside down so we'll even that movie will have to be posted prior to our eighth meeting because they need 48 hours notice so you'll be able to see like why are all these meetings but they're just gonna be all posted and then we'll just cancel them all that was what months. you said that was yesterday or today. Yeah. yeah just trying to keep it all organized as you can see it gets using is the tentative budget figure there's a point, one of those votes that we take, you can't go up, you can only get down from there. You can't increase the budget after that point. Is that the final one for the tentative? After the public hearing, you're not supposed to. Right. That's not legally set, right? It's just best practice. The question is, is it legal? I don't know for what reason you want to go up, but you're going to go up and do it now before you right. take any right. votes. I think it's, we, were, we had this discussion at and we did at the public hearing you never go up after the public hearing so if people have questions or comments on that budget now to make it if you want to make it a little higher then now's the time to talk about that want to bring it forward as is bring it forward as is and have the hearing on that number i think by having only three percent and being two point something is closer to 2.5 than 3.91 or whatever it was yeah i think you know we have to be comfortable with the fact that we can pull this off because he'd be out of it if we if we didn't you know if we had to do this some other way but they work together to come up with this stuff and it's it's the impact is is a lot less severe this way i think it benefits us in the long run, if we can pull this out of this way. So I will uh, move the tentative budget fit here, and you'll have to, because you've got to add two things together here, right? Come up with the, the big number. Yeah, I don't, do they need to vote on the actual number right now? I think just moving the budget forward. You just, this is more of an internal. As presented. This is yeah. more of an internal, like making sure we got a All right, then that will be that. Especially if Phil's got a motion. We'll move on to something else. We're not moving another motion. Do you want a vote of support to move the 2.92 budget as presented forward to the public hearing? So it's a vote of support, right? It's Perfect. not a vote not of the budget. Is that what I said? <coughs> you said support the draft. Oh, oh yeah. Draft. Put the word draft in there. Clean it all up. And she will get it right. We'll give her all the artistic license that she needs to make it sound like it's You have no idea what I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a first and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? So moved. She's writing like Bill said with a sigh. He rolled his eyes at that. It's very powerful. <laughs>
I have nothing. Lynn's not here for the collaborative, so it's up to the big guy. Do you have anything for us? Other than what you've talked about already? <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? Um, the, you should have gotten all gotten the sign-up sheet if you're interested in meeting with the um, M M exec oh my God, sorry. Um, the uh, equity audit. Thank you. Um, if none of those times work, let me know because we can also squeeze you in, especially during the day at different times. Um, or you can go to the parent thing at night. That's been sent out, but if um, you don't get the time she sent you, I think she wrote that in her um, email to you all to just reach out. Um, also, the I sent out today, I had met with um, Ken and Bob. We were talking about the June 38 agreement, the frontier right now. It's bouncing back and forth with their attorney. Um, and in that came the evaluation ask, can we move the evaluation process up to be, be done at the joint meeting? And so we went to, I went to the first meeting in Sunderland and was reminded by a Sunderland member, um, she was here, she left. Jessica reminded me that um, being in my fourth year, I don't need to be evaluated after the first three years, you can go on a two year cycle. And so I went back to Bob and um, Ken about want to do a two year cycle and they're looking for approval from all the committees to do that, which is an awkward way to do it because I'm going to each committee saying that, but <laughs> basically after it's the same as teachers after you get professional status, which technically I have after three years, I, I technically don't have professional status because it doesn't work in administrative things, but they allow you to go on a two year cycle for evaluation. Um, also within my contract, it allows it as long as we mutually agree following the state law. So that was the back and forth we had. So. Awkwardly, I bring that to you the discussion whether or not you want to do the evaluation or not. Um, started putting it together. So if it's on the agenda, do we still vote on it? Can we, can we still vote on it? Or do we have to wait for the next meeting and do? You know, the other ones just said they agreed with you. So we want to make it. But can you? It wasn't on the agenda. So I don't. All right, so I put it on the agenda. Yeah. Get you stuff just to. No, I guess I would just question every. Would we be putting two things on there, one to move up the timeline and the, the other to move to a two-year cycle, or? I think you would be just agreeing to do the two-year cycle for the superintendent's agenda, okay. I mean, uh, evaluation. Okay. Have you heard anything from the lawyer on what you sent them yet? Oh, regarding the June 38. So the June 38 committee got together, I think, um, and created a basically kind of the rules of how to um, how to govern the superintendent, so to speak, um, with the five committees, because we don't have a regional agreement that's in print anywhere. Um, and what's clear is that we must have, because some of the rules that we do have to follow through general practice. It's kind of it's kind of feels like like a anthropology kind of thing, kind of digging in, because it's like we're doing systems that are found in other uh, Union 38 agreement, Union, union agreements rather. But our Union 30 agreement doesn't exist, right? Because we can't find it. So there's no rule. So we put together a bunch of rules regarding how to hire, discipline, and remove the superintendent. Okay, um, that you guys would all vote on. So I took it to the attorney who said, like, he's like he struggled with it because he goes, it's not a union agreement. It's just a it's a group of rules. It, it doesn't within and within that a union agreement. The regional school doesn't have a say. The four towns have a say because it's a union agreement. And so he said, you're going to have a lot of trouble changing that setup. That you currently have where frontier actually right now makes a lot of decisions regarding central office and so on and so forth so um he said he wanted to bring it to the state and get their opinion on it so he brought it to the state he had a hearing with them um they understood our predicament and so he's going to be giving up recommendations within it but it's still not going to be a union agreement it's just going to be one step closer to a union agreement which at least we'll have protocols to move forward if i was to resign and you had to hire a superintendent how does the voting work if there's disagreement? It's easy when everybody agrees, but if you had a, if you had a, you know, one group of people, one town versus another not agree. Um, also, if you had, if if I had to be disciplined by one school committee but not by another, can the other school committee vote on my discipline? How does that all work? You know what I mean? Because it gets kind of it can get very complicated very quickly, and you know, I lawyer up. <laughs> you know, so you know, I mean, so I mean, you know, just be, you know, so that's just how it is. So you want to have 
and I'm the one pushing this forward here. So don't quote that. Don't quote that. <laughs> um, it's like, what can I even write? This meeting is all blacked out. Um, <laughs> don't write that either. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. You need that you but I'm the one pushing this forward because I see it as a loophole that you have, that you need to have um, concrete decision making when it comes to the employment of your um, of your executive there. And so you got to have a smooth process of you need to remove me for some reason. You got to have a smooth process of what that looks like and how you can and can't do that. It's not the loudest voice in the room. It's got to make sure everybody has equal representation each down, blah blah blah. And so that's what we're trying to. But I, I saw that one, you know, during the hiring process and stuff in the last few years. It gets it's foggy. We don't want foggy if there's a transition of power, do we, as a nation? We don't want foggy. We don't want foggy. <laughs> anyway, so I will have that as soon as you get it back from Russ. Um, and then it'll come around for you. And then also getting determination it has to go to town or not. They may not because it's going to be within governance of this. And so he's getting legal opinion on that as well. Whether or not an agreement between our committees has to go to a town to be approved, or if the committees can do an internal agreement. Originally, we thought it had to go to the town because it's changing of the union agreement. See, I'm looking at Keith because he's on the committee, and we went round and round on some of this stuff. Probably should have rest at the table at the first meeting. So. Might want to head spin right now. I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to wait for the next one. Yeah. Hopefully, right. Phil won't be there. <laughs> Anything else? Don't read that. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have anything on that Do you have anything else? No, it's like. Right. Still chair on this chair? Yeah, second. Yes. Hold on. I Hold just, on. but Darius, I, I didn't get a chance to, I've been back and forth with IT half the day today. Um, did the old my email so I could take notes today. So I just, I didn't get a chance to send you guys a, an email back. Thank you for the, the way that you address the, the health newsletter. And, okay, uh, I appreciate taking that time. Just want to take a minute to let you know that. Sorry, you can we'll make the motion continue second with it. the journey. I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Good night, everybody.